The 90s was a fun time. It was the humble beginnings to technology that would forever change our society, like cable television and the World Wide Web. It contained the birth of hip hop, grunge, and the rave scene, and it opened its arms to the flood of capitalism thanks to neoliberalism. It's also one hell of a time for nostalgia. So today we are taking some time to reflect on the gifts that were given to us from the comics industry in that decade, with our list of the top 10 super villains from the 90s. And many villains from the 90s tended to venture into some pretty ridiculous territory, with a more serious and radical nature than the silliness of the Silver Age. I'm so sorry. While other villains who were created in this era would go on to enjoy mass popularity and evolve into more complex characters. So with that in mind, let's get to it. In at number 10, Deadpool. Deadpool is the epitome of 90s comic book superheroes, although at the time of his debut, he was a villain. It wasn't until several years after his debut that he ventured into the anti-hero territory. But let's jump back a sec. Deadpool was created by Rob Liefeld, a fellow who is largely considered to be one of the best comic book artists during that decade. But he also drew this, and this, and who could forget this, Captain America's refrigerator sized chest. Anywho, being incredibly similar to DC's Deathstroke aka Slade Wilson, Liefeld jokingly named him Wade Wilson, an inside joke that was pretty obvious. By 1997, the character had acquired quite the cult-like following, and under the pen of Joe Kelly, Deadpool began breaking the fourth wall and getting meta as hell. Christopher Priest, who would write the character afterwards, only further elaborated on the personality that we all love and know today. And at 9, Strife. Another Marvel character at this number, let's talk about Strife, a fellow who first appeared in the New Mutants issue 86 in 1990. He is a clone of Cable. Now for starters, Cable is Jean Grey and Cyclops' son from the distant future who was infected with something called a techno or organic virus. Cable is not to be confused with Nate Grey, who is from an alternate timeline and is also the son of Gene and Scott, but did not get infected with said virus. Now Strife is Cable's clone, who has a better grip on Cable's psionic abilities thanks to not being infected by the techno-organic virus. He was stolen as an infant by Apocalypse, who raised him as his own and called him Strife great name for a child, all with the intention of using him as his next host. Overall, major parenting fail. Strife would become a madman, embittered, wanting vengeance on his real parents, and also on Apocalypse too. And could you just look at his character design? Can you get any more 90s than that? Gotta love strange armor nipples. Love is not the right word for that. <laughs> and at number 8, Monarch. Monarch is another villain who looks like he stopped, dropped, and rolled right out of the 90s. There's been a few monarchs over the years, but we are going to talk about the first, Hank Hall, the man who was formerly superhero Hawk. First appearing in Armageddon 2001, issue 2 in 1991, Monarch came from a dystopian Earth, a bleak reality in which he is an oppressive tyrant in the year 2030, which is way too close to the year now, because we're going into 2020, that's scary as a man from that time, a scientist named Matthew Ryder, travels back in time to the year 1991, a pivotal time in order to prevent Monarch of the future from becoming a reality. The reveal that Hank Hall was the future Monarch stirred up some controversy. Initially, the character was meant to be revealed to be Captain Adam, but after his identity was prematurely leaked, DC switched it to Hank, which did not necessarily align with all the clues that were persistent in the lead up to said reveal. Long story short, Monarch is 90s as f and at 7, Shriek. The symbiotes were a hot commodity in the 90s. With the rise of Venom's popularity, the emergence of Cletus Casti, more on that later, and the emergence of more Clintar offspring, it's hard to not consider them an essential part to Marvel's growth in that decade. Shriek, who is not a symbiote but was introduced in 1993 alongside them in Spider Man Ultimate Issue 1, Volume 1, became a memorable chunk of that era as a supporting character, specifically during the Maximum Carnage story arc. Now, her abilities, which allowed her to generate and manipulate sound waves, made her an invaluable ally of Carnage when fighting against the likes of Venom. Sonic waves are a weakness of symbiotes. I think we can all agree that Shriek was a little bit weird though. She had a bit of an obsession with motherhood, presumably a result of her abusive childhood, and saw Doppelganger as her and Carnage's child, despite it just being a nefarious clone of Peter Parker's Spider-Man. And at 6, the DNA Dictators. Oh, the DNA Dictators are so very much a product of the 90s that it hurts. In 1995, DC released an Elseworlds title called Superman at Earth's End. Set in a post-apocalyptic timeline, Superman goes around fighting an army of mutated nightmarish Batman. During it, a group of villains known as the DNA Dictators steal Bruce Wayne's corpse. The leaders of this group turn out to actually be two twin clones of Adolf Hitler, who had killed their creators. Ah. Cyborgs and Nazism. That pretty much sums up the entirety of the comic. In a decade where we'd see the likes of films like The Matrix emerge, the futuristic vibe of At Earth's End was something that the dictators fully embraced, along with being bigots, of course. In at number five, 
Cod Piece. If you thought our last number was fun, make room for Cod Piece, people. He's just as bad as his name suggests. Cod Piece has no secret identity. He believes that he is rejected by women because his junk, yes, his manly bits, are not big enough. So what does he do? Well, he takes overcompensating to a whole nother level by getting himself a costume that has a cod piece multi-weapon attached to it, which of course sits right on his crotch. Where else? This magical but not actually magical cod piece could act as a cannon. It could fire missiles. It had two retractable boxing gloves. And even had some handy tools to boot, like drills and scissors. Naturally, he first appeared in an issue of Doom Patrol, number 70, volume 2, which came out in 1993. I mean, dude could have just like bought a Ferrari or something. Jeez. Overcompensating. Nothing like a villain with an inferiority complex. <laughs> And at number 4, Doomsday. In the early 90s, specifically in 1992, DC decided that they would kill off Superman. It was partially the result of a tie in with the Lois and Clark TV series at the time, a reason why Superman's wedding to Lois would be delayed. But the story was also a really good way to boost sales for the publisher. Superman's sales had recently decreased, and after DC killed him off, that issue alone, where he died, sold over 6 million copies. So, how did the Man of Steel die? By getting into a literal punching match with this fellow, who first appeared in Superman The Man of Steel issue 18 and basically looks like a Hulk ripoff. Yes, this is Doomsday. He was the answer to giving Clark a foe who didn't have to rely on technology or intellect to defeat the Man of Steel. So what is Doomsday's deal? He was born during prehistoric times on Krypton which had a hellish violent terrain. A scientist in a cruel experiment to study evolution took Doomsday to the surface of the planet as an infant and allowed him to be killed off by the environment. He then collected the baby's remains and then used them to clone a stronger version. He repeated this process over and over and over, with the repeated deaths being recorded in Doomsday's genes, causing him to hate all life and kill his maker. In more recent years, Doomsday has shed his Hulk-like aesthetic, although is still jacked to high heavens. He is often portrayed as having more detail and more spikes than his initial incarnation. In at number 3, Parallax. Parallax was a villain who came into prominence thanks to the same story arc as our last number, the death of Superman. Except Parallax, an entity that embodies fear, has nothing to do with Superman. Rather, he is primarily involved with the Green Lanterns. After Superman's death, a bunch of imposter versions of him popped up, one of which destroyed Green Lantern Hal Jordan's home, Coast City. Hal lost shit. Use his ring to bring everyone back to life and rebuild the city, and then got in trouble with the Guardians, who tried to book him on the fact that he used his ring for personal gain. A big no no. Hal, of course, goes on a rampage, beats the crap out of a bunch of other lanterns, and is revealed that he has actually been possessed by Parallax all along. Debuting in 1994, emerging from its imprisonment inside the central power battery, Parallax would grow into a staple character in Green Lantern comics for years to come. And also, the fear metaphor was kind of an interesting play, especially considering the things going on in 90s culture at the time. Lots of fear mongering in the media. And at number 2, Harley Quinn. Harley Quinn came about in a very interesting way. Unlike most of the other villains on this list, Harley's origins weren't in the comics, but rather in Batman the Animated Series in 1992. She would later be introduced into the comics in 1993 in the Batman Adventures issue 12 and go on to become one of DC's most popular villains. Similar to Deadpool, these days she is more of an anti-hero, no longer being defined by her very toxic relationship to the clown prince of crime, Batman's arch nemesis, the Joker. But back in the day, she was his psychic of sorts, his love interest, who he would happen to insult, ignore, and hurt on a frequent basis. Yeah, kind of moved on to better things. And finally, in at one, Carnage. When you think of 90s supervillains, there's a very good chance that the evil symbiote Carnage is one of the first to pop into your head. The offspring of Venom, one of Spider Man's biggest antagonists, Carnage took Venom's somewhat sinister behavior and one upped it big time. Carnage's host was Cletus Cassidy, a brutal and gruesome serial killer who just so happened to be Eddie Brock's cellmate during a brief stint in prison. Now, when Venom broke Brock out of prison, it secretly released its offspring, something that the symbiote race of Clintars do, since they ain't really into being parental. Venom thought nothing of it, and didn't even tell Brock. That is, until his offspring bonded with Cassidy, called itself Carnage, and then went on a murderous rampage, writing taunts to Brock in his victim's blood. Maximum Carnage it was. Eventually, he was thwarted by Spidey and Venom, who had to team up in order to take him on thanks to the rules of the symbiote offspring. The offspring of a Clintar is always biologically stronger than its parent. Yikes. There we have it, friends. Now, there's a whole lot of other 90s villains that we could dive into, so give us a shout in those comments below if you'd like to see a part 2. And surely a list that will mock Onslaught, who definitely gets an honorable mention on this one. If you guys dug this video, spread that love, hit that like button, and be sure to subscribe to Top 10 Nerd for more lists just like this. We even have a nifty little playlist currently flashing on your screen, so give it a click. In the meantime, though, thanks for watching, friends. I'll catch you all in the next video.